Matthew chapter 26. We'll pick up where we left off last week in verse 31. Before I do that, let me remind you, we are in, uh, this is, actually we've moved into the Thursday of the Passion Week of Jesus' Passion Week. He will die the next day. This is a crucial day in that week. Um, It's been a long time on Wednesday, but as he comes into Thursday, for him, Jesus is a Galilean Jew. He's from the north in Galilee. The Galilean Jews, their day began at sunrise. Sunrise to sunrise is when a day began for the northern Jews. In the south, their days began sunset to sunset. For Jesus, it's Passover. It's Nisan 14. To you and me, it's Thursday. To them, it's Nisan 14. Nisan 14 for them began at sunrise on this Thursday, and it will end at sunrise on Friday. For the Judean Jews, those down south, their Nisan 14 begins at sunset on Thursday and will go until Friday at sunset. Are you good and confused? I want you to know that I'm introducing it to you today as we go forward. You're going to see Jesus ate the Passover meal. We looked at that last week on Thursday. And yet before he goes, when he goes to his uh, accusers, the Jews don't want to go into Pilate's praetorium because they would be defiled and not be able to eat the Passover. And you think, wait a minute, Jesus just had the Passover a day earlier. What's going on? It's a difference in time schedules. The whole day is Nisan 14. It is the day of the Passover. And on that day, Jesus has told his disciples, we're going to go into the city. And they did. There was an upper room prepared for them. And they ate the last supper together. Jesus makes a Nazarite vow. and says, I will not touch the fruit of the vine again. I'm not going to have it one more time until I come back in my kingdom and we have it together. We wait that. We await that day. In fact, that's what the Lord's Supper is. We remember the death of Jesus and we look forward to his return as we did last week. Um, in John chapter 1, um, John chapter 13, John 13, 14, 15 is called the upper room and 16 is called the upper room discourse. It's what Matthew, Mark, and Luke called the synoptic gospels don't give us. John gives us great detail on what happened in that upper room, the night they partook of the Passover, Jesus washed their feet in, Matthew thir- in John chapter 13. He tells them he, he washed each of their feet to display to them um, how they would, should serve one another and displaying his own humility towards them, his own love for them. Um, in 14 and 15, he gives them further teaching. In 16 and John 17, we have a, a, a much more expanded view of Jesus' prayer time. We'll look at tonight at, or today in the, as he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane. John 17 gives us this high priestly prayer. And by John 18, there's the arrest of Jesus, which we'll look at today in Matthew. But what I want to show you is John 13, 1. If you're not there, just listen. It says this. Now, before the feast of the Passover, that's where we are in our context in Matthew. John 13, 1 says, Now, before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, Everything he's done up to this point, he knows his hour is upon him, and he's going to depart back to the Father. It says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Having loved his own, that is, everything he's done up to this point, he has loved his people. And now he will love them to the end. The reason I want to bring that up is because don't miss throughout the entire portrayal of this horrible night, this portrayal of Jesus' life, it's all about one thing, love. Jesus is showing his love. He's doing what he's doing out of love. He doesn't have to be here. Jesus has gone, even as the song says, you came from heaven to earth to show us the way. He did. He left heaven and he came to earth to show us the way, to show us that he loves us. And everything he's going through, this hell on earth, is because he loves us. We don't see it peppered throughout the text. Now, Jesus is doing this out of love. Jesus is doing this out of love. Make sure you remember love. But John 13, 1 reminds us. What he's done up to this point is all about love, and what he will do to the very end is about his love for you and me. Don't you like to be loved? Do you ever remind yourself that you are loved by God? Let me me give you a a challenge. Lay in bed at night or wherever you choose to be alone and just keep saying it over and over. God, you love me. You love me. You really love me. Say it over and over and then say it back. And God, I love you. I love you. Say it over and over. I don't care if you're a man and you don't like it and you feel funny. 
keep saying it till you don't feel funny. Because that's what permeates this Bible. Jesus says after Peter had denied him on three occasions when he is resurrected and he returns and he sees Peter, he gives Peter three chances to redeem himself, it looks like. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you, Lord. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. You heard me before. You know I love you. Tend my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Peter was grieved at the third point. Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Now, I look at that as a preacher, and I think, how can I show my love for God? Feed his sheep. Now, someone like me, who's not a touchy-feely, sappy kind of a guy, doesn't get, no one goes away going, well, that Lance is a loving fella, isn't he? I mean, how many of you have ever said that at Lance? He just, he exudes love. It's not that funny. And yet, I can tell you, you know, that's typically what you see is, is someone with a big smile and the touchy feeliness. They have to hug every time they see you, and, and they, they just, they have that. I wish I had that. That doesn't mean that that person has love and one like me doesn't. Love is shown when you care for God's people. When you care for God's people, you do it with a scowl on your face if you have to. Right, Phil? My good buddy, Phil. Come on, smile, Phil. Come on. There you go. That's the biggest <laughs> smile he's got. You can love people with a scowl on your face. When you love them, you give them the truth. You feed them God's word. It's what Jesus did. It's what his disciples did. It's what you and I are to go do. So as we look at Matthew 26, 31. After they had sung a hymn on the Mount of Olives, they had completed what they were doing in the Lord's Supper that night. Verse 31, Jesus said to them, probably right. I remember after we sung our hymn last week, we closed in the hymn like, the scripture did, like they did in the scripture here. And I said, may the Lord bless you and go on. L last week, at least in the night, on the night that Jesus died, after they sung the hymn, they closed the song, and no one went to lunch. It's late at night. They all just sat there. What do we do now? And Jesus looked at them, probably after a moment of silence, and said this, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. It's a quote from Zechariah 13:7. Wait a minute, we just ate with you. You just washed our feet. We just got the greatest teaching that we've had in three and a half years with you, Jesus. We've had this intimate moment, and now he looks at them and says, you will all fall away this night to fulfill what was written in Zechariah 13, 7. What was written in Zechariah 13, 7 is that one of God's leaders, one of God's chosen men who had, was directing and leading God's flock would be taken away, and his flock would be scattered. That's what happens if you're a literal shepherd. When the shepherd is gone, the sheep go away. They must have a shepherd. Throughout the Bible, a pastor, the word pastor means shepherd. Uh, the pastor is the under-shepherd of the good shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. He leads us. When the shepherd goes, his people go, and Jesus tells them now, after this kind of a high, you will all fall away. The word there is scandalizo. It's where we get the word scandal. You will fall away. When I go away, you will fall away. But he says in verse 32, but after I've been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Now that's a sobering thing to tell anybody. He's told them before. He's told them on at least three occasions up to this point. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They're going to crucify me, and three days later, I'm going to rise. Now, the first time they said it, Peter in chapter 16 said, no way, Lord, it's not going to happen. I won't, let, I won't let you do that. We're not going to Jerusalem for you to die. Peter didn't understand. Jesus came to die. At any time, Jesus could walk away and say, I don't want to do this. But he came to die. His mission to, become from, to go from heaven to earth, to come from heaven to earth, was to die, to live our lives and die our death. And he says again, after I've been raised, he knows what's going to happen. He knows that they'll scatter. He knows he's going to be raised. And guys, let's make an appointment. Jot it down in your, in your little iPads. I'm going to meet you in Galilee. 
Now, they're in Judea right now. In fact, they're in the city of Jerusalem. Galilee would be, uh, you've got Judea in the south. That's a region. And then you go up through the, the region of Samaria. And then you get to the region of Galilee. A couple days walk. You get to Galilee and Jesus is saying, I'll meet you there. Most of the disciples are from Galilee. But Peter said to him, in all of his bravado, even though all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Up to this point in Luke's gospel, Luke twenty two thirty one, 31, uh, Jesus tells Peter right before this, he said, Peter, he says, Simon, Simon, Satan himself has asked for your life to sift you like wheat, he says. Satan has come to me. Peter, and asked for you. And then he said, but I've prayed for you. In other words, he can't have you. He wants you because you're the leader, Peter, and if I'm gone, he knows that if he gets the leader, he'll lead the entire flock astray. But I prayed for you, Peter, and you will lead your brothers. Peter's not there yet. Jesus sees Peter in the future. He's not there yet. Peter and all his bravado is, even though they walk, fall away from you, Lord, not me. You ever think that of your faith? How many of you, without raising your hand, think that you're better than everyone else? You're in a dangerous, dangerous spot. I don't care how old you are, how long you've been walking with Christ. Usually when we're young, we think we've got it all. When we get older, maybe we think we, we really have it all. Even though all fall away because of you, not me. Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you. In fact, in John 13, 37, Jesus, or Peter said, I will give my life for you. Not just though all fall away. Peter said, I will give my life for you. And in John's gospel, Jesus looks at him and he says, really, Pete? Will you give your life for me? Because I tell you the truth. Before the night is over, you will deny knowing me three times. You will deny me. You say you will die for me? You're going to deny me. What does that say about our God? The late Keith Green wrote a song called um, Grace by Which I Stand. And it's sung today. I like the better version is by Steve Green. Uh, just the singing part. Uh, and, and he essentially is nothing lasts except the grace of God by which I stand. The second stanza goes something like this. He says, Lord, I remember that special day I vowed to serve you when it was brand new. No doubt he's talking about his faith. I remember that special day when I vowed to serve you when it was brand new. And then Keith says, but... I have to sing it in my head as I go through it. It's hard to, hard to quote. I remember that special day when I vowed to serve you and it was brand new. But like Peter, I can't even watch and pray one hour with you. And I bet I could deny you too. Nothing lasts except the grace of God by which I stand in Jesus. And then he says, I'm sure my whole life would surely waste away except for grace, by which I'm saved. Peter has that attitude. I've had it. I get it. It comes and goes. Not me. Everyone else, not me. I'll stand firm. When everyone else is gone, Lord, you'll find me standing. Oh, gosh. He sees tomorrow. He didn't have to see tomorrow for Peter. He saw the next couple of hours. Peter... You will deny that you even know my name. This very night before the rooster crows, verse 35, Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. All the disciples said the same thing too. Oh yeah, Lord, not us. No, you've got it wrong. The overestimation of our faith to know that we have faith is one thing. To know that we are saved. The faith that we have in Jesus seals us for eternity. You cannot lose it. You can't go off and deny Christ and Christ say, oh, goodness, I've got to cut you loose. You can't. You can deny him, but you can't be cut loose. Not if you're really saved. 
you and I are capable of the most atrocious sins. We are capable. Remember what Peter, what Jesus told Peter in John chapter 13. He said, you're already clean, all of you, except for Judas. And the one who's clean only needs to wash. That's why I wash their feet. Your body's clean. I just need to wipe the dirt off your feet. Probably an allusion to the fact that when we come to Christ, we are sealed in Christ, saved for eternity. And yet we continue to sin. We confess our sins and we have those washed away too. Probably an allusion to that. And yet, this man who saw Jesus, walked with him, saw his miracles, believed in Jesus. Clearly, Peter believed in Jesus. He had that heart of a lion. I will stand firm with you. And yet he was reduced. He was reduced almost to a little sissy when a little girl asked him, hey, I know you. You were with him. No, that wasn't me. By the third time, Peter is saying, by God's name, I take the oath of oaths. I don't know him. Nothing lasts except the grace of God. Whew, that's worth worshiping. I am so weak. If Peter can do this, I can do it. All the disciples think the same thing. Jesus came with them. They were in the, in, the, uh, in the upper room in Jerusalem. They'd gone down into the Garden of Gethsemane. The word Gethsemane means oil press or olive press, I should say. And today, even you can go down there and there's these big gnarly trees. Some are huge. Their trunks are huge. Uh, an oil press. Olive press, I should say. I keep saying oil press. Olive press to get oil. Very well wooded, and this Jesus and his disciples had been there on many occasions. And he went down to this place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. So there's the 11 of them. Judas is left, is gone. It's 11 of the men and Jesus, so there's 12 of them all together. They go down into the garden. Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him, and you can probably see him looking. Guys, sit here. Peter? James, John, y'all come with me. And they go over to another location. The garden isn't very big. It's not huge. Uh, You can throw a rock the distance of of the garden today. And he takes these three with him. Peter, James, and John. Matthew just says the two sons of Zebedee. We know that's James and John. He takes with him. And I've underlined in my Bible here the, the, the prepositional phrase, with him. And in the verse 38, with me. And in verse 40, with me, because it's, it's meaningful to me. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. Now, this is God in the flesh, grieved and distressed. Two words together that have two similar meanings. Doesn't need a whole lot of information on what the Greek means. It means to be grieved and distressed. It means to be so at the end of who you are, at the end of your rope, that you have nowhere else to go. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been so grieved over something and so distressed, you feel it physically? And when you feel this way, you take, you call, you summon your closest friends, if you have any. And so he takes these three with him, and he began, I like the word, he began to be grieved and distressed. Up to this point, he probably was not. Everything was an episode. I've done this, I'm moving to that. And now as he moves into Gethsemane, what is upon him? By the way, just note that, do you remember when you were a kid, if you were spanked, and I know that was a previous generation, And I know I could get arrested and have my kids taken from me just by saying and promoting spanking. But you remember if you if you were in my generation or before to get spanked, we got spanked at school. You got put in this room called the conference room when I was in school. Take Jeremy to the conference room, and Jeremy would be in the conference room. And I remember looking out the door, and the conference room door would open, and there's Jeremy shaking like a leaf. Those minutes, or maybe. Maybe you're going, to get a, you're going to get pops at school. Maybe you're going to get them at home. Maybe it's a both and for you. 
Mom always told me if it happens at school, it's going to happen again at home. I made sure it never happened at school. It happened a lot at home, mind you. But those moments leading up, or when, when your father gets here, you're in for a whooping. And, and leading up, those moments leading up to dad coming home. Heck, I wasn't afraid of my dad. It was my mom, all five foot nothing of her. And her breadboard or her hairbrush. It was that anticipation. What have I done? That's a silly reminder compared to Jesus who is going to take the wrath of God for your sin and my sin. That's the state in which our Lord is in, in his humanity. And you see his divinity and his humanity, and his divinity knows everything that's going to happen, and that's why in his humanity he's scared out of his mind. And I say that, scared almost out of his mind. He is grieved and distressed. I've written in my Bible there, ought not we be too? If the wrath of God is so harsh as to take Jesus in his flesh and cause him to be grieved and distressed to the point where Luke says he was sweating drops of blood, ought we not be grieved and distressed if we're not in Christ? Some of you sit out there today, you're not a Christian. You have no intention of being one. You're just here. Maybe you're a kid. Mom and dad brought you here. You're not into this, and you're thinking, I'm going to be out of here as soon as I'm 18 or whatever it may be. Maybe someone dragged you here today, and you don't want to be here. Maybe your spouse is, and you're not. Why are you not afraid of the wrath of God? Because I don't believe in God. That's a good way. Just make sure God doesn't exist, and you can live any way you want. But your imagination that he doesn't exist doesn't mean he doesn't exist. Just because you think it doesn't mean it's true. Truth is not relative. Truth is. It doesn't matter if you and I believe it. What is, is. And there is a God. And that God is full of love and compassion and has given us an opportunity to be saved from his wrath because of this moment. Jesus of Nazareth will take it all upon himself and he is grieved. And he said to them in verse 38, my soul is deeply grieved. Notice this, to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. With me. I I, want to cry when I look at it. Because they don't. Keep watch means stay awake. Guys, I know it's late. Will you stay awake with me? Will you just be with me sometimes when you're in the, not sometimes, all the time, when you're in the worst, when you're in your worst possible state? Sometimes you don't want to be directly with someone in the same room facing each other in a chair. Maybe you just want to be off by yourself a little bit, but know that someone is very nearby that loves you. That's what Jesus wanted. With me. Will you stay awake with me? Because I'm grieved to the point of death. Our Lord is about to die. The grief is so strong. Some of you have been there. You felt the heart rate just soar through the roof. It frightened you. Maybe it sent you to the hospital. Maybe it was stress. Maybe it was distress. Maybe someone passed away and you, someone you loved. Maybe you lost a job. You don't know how you're going to pay your bills. Maybe your child is sick. Maybe you've been betrayed. Maybe friends that you once loved don't love you. And you feel it. You're deeply grieved and you feel Not only to the point of death, you're praying for it. That's where Jesus is here. Why? Because he loves us. Because he loves us. At any time, he could say, I'm done. I'm not going to do this. Remain here. Stay awake. Keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them. And he fell on his face. It doesn't mean that he tripped but it is the word fell. Have you been there? In your deep, darkest distress. You don't put a little cushion there where you're going to bow your knees. You don't set everything up, as I do sometimes when I pray. I want to get this and get that right. My back hurts. My knees. I want to make sure I can get back up from my prayer posture. All the cracks and groans that come with that. No, sometimes you just fall down. 
Have you been there? You just fell. You didn't care. It hurt. Maybe you fell on your bed. Maybe you fell on a bean bag. Maybe you fell on pillows. Maybe you just fell to your knees and plopped down on your face prostrate before God. That's what Jesus does. does. He fell on his face and he prayed saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Let this cup. The cup is a metaphor of the wrath of God. The cup of God's wrath. Jesus is not afraid of death. Don't think that for a minute. In fact, if you will, just to prove it, Matthew 10, 28. Turn over there with me to the left. Matthew 10, 28. Matthew 10, 28. Jesus' own words. Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. In the New American Standard Bible, him is, is capitalized. The him, the pronoun, refers to God. Don't fear men. They can kill you. They can butcher you and cut you up into a bunch of pieces. You're already dead. Don't fear that. Fear this. Fear the God of the universe who can what? He's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Is Jesus afraid he's going to be destroyed in hell? No. He is fearful, taking upon the sins of the world, upon himself. Because of what you and I did. Is that fair? Who does that? I might do that for an innocent person. But for guilty people like me and you? Jesus asks his father, if it is possible. We read about the man that came to Jesus. And Jesus said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus said, I am willing. Be clean. And then the other one who said, Lord, if you can, if I can, he says, all things are possible to those who believe. This is a different prayer request, if possible. And you know what the answer to the question was, to the prayer? From God the Father to God the Son? It's not. It's not possible. It's not possible, Jesus, that I take my cup from you. You're going to drink it. But Jesus is open to it. Yet not as I will, but as you will. You ever pray that? Because if you don't, you're probably really mad at God right now. You see, our prayer requests rise up before him from human beings, and we have nothing but selfishness to ask God for. We want more. We want less. We want, we want bliss right here. We want utopia right here, don't we? And we don't get it. We don't understand why. Lord, I'm praying for it. I say in Jesus' name at the end of every prayer, I prayed for the food, and then I got food poisoning. What's up with that? I prayed for this person. They never got saved. I prayed for a new job. I prayed that this would go well. You said no. You say no all the time. No, no, no. Are you encouraged at all that even the Lord Jesus Christ got a no? Why? It wasn't God's will. And in his humanity, we see the separation between Jesus' divinity and his humanity. Even though they're all one in his humanity... Jesus is scared out of his mind, almost out of his mind. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Verse 40, And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you could not keep watch with me for one hour? In the modern terminology, he would look at him and he would say what most kids say today. Really? Really, Pete? John? Come on, James. And you can just see them kind of coming out of their slumber. I mean, when you fall asleep, if you're like me, if you go to bed late and you get an hour of sleep after you've gone to bed late, you wake up and you just have these cobwebs everywhere. A big bedhead. Eyes smooch down from laying on the ground. They probably got dirt on them from laying on the ground. They're tired. Really? You couldn't stay awake for one hour in my darkest moment? How many of you ever felt like that? You felt completely abandoned in your darkest moment. All you asked someone to do, will you pray with me? 
will you listen to me? Will you talk to me? If you've ever been let down by a situation like this, then you can relate a little bit to Jesus here. One hour. But like Peter, I can't even pray one hour with you and I'll bet I could deny you too. And you know when you miss an opportunity like this, it doesn't come back. Yet Jesus in his grace gives him another opportunity. Guys, I'm going to go do it again. Will you stay awake? Look at it, verse 41. Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. Sleeping again. How many opportunities have we missed because we're tired? You know, I thought about this all week, all week. And at first, early in the week, I started thinking, did they even know what to pray for? Jesus didn't say, stay here, you're awake, and pray for this. He didn't give them something. And when you don't know what to pray for, if you're like me, you try to pray and then you find yourself four hours later getting up to go to the bathroom and saying, did I ever say amen from that prayer? And then I thought about it more and more. I thought, Jesus just told them the shepherd's going to be struck, the sheep are going to flee. He told them, I'm going to die. I'll meet you in Galilee. After I'm raised up, I'll meet you in Galilee. He's told them that three times prior anyway. He told Peter, you're going to deny me. I'm looking at this now, and I'm thinking, they've got plenty to pray for. While Jesus goes off, the, th- the three of those men, are, he told me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deny him. John, pray that I don't. James, pray that I don't. He said, we're all going to scatter. Let's pray for each other and our, our brothers over there at the other side of the garden. But no, they go to sleep. I look at that and I look at our world today and where we are, where the church of Jesus Christ is today. The church of Jesus Christ is a joke. All you got to do is look at the news and look at the way the world views us. Heck, nine times out of ten, they're right. We are a bunch of hypocrites. They get on us now, well, you voted for Trump, you can't be any good. There really wasn't much to vote for. I mean, had to pick one, right? Or abstain altogether. The way the world views us, I was reading an article yesterday and today. Millennials, millennials don't think anything about God. They don't think anything about church-going people. By and large, 85% of them are not going to go back to church. They don't believe in the God you and I believe in. Certainly not the God of the greatest generation and the baby boomers. They don't believe in that God. Why? Because of the way we act. There's something to pray for. Not only that, if Peter can deny Christ, we can too. Ought we not pray for that? They had something to pray for, but they were too dull to do it. So they didn't. They fell asleep instead. You see, when you are passionate about the sin that can get you, 1 Peter 5, 8, Peter says, Beware of the devil who prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. When we know he's out there, and we know he's going to try to, he's he's like a fisherman. You know, a guy once told me, he said, you know, Satan is like a fisherman. He's got a tackle box. And he knows what your weakness is, and that's the lure he uses. He throws it out. Didn't bite on that one? He's got another one. What's yours? Is it food? Is it money? Is it sex? Materialism? Fame? What is your lure? He's going to find it. If you and I are not praying for that for ourselves, hook, line, sinker. That's what he did with Peter. And when we're sleepy and we want to fulfill the desires of the flesh, we can say what Jesus said, Lord, my spirit is willing, my flesh is weak, but is that an excuse? Let the spirit of God inside of us overwhelm our flesh. It has to or we lose the battle. If the spirit of God inside of us does not overwhelm our fleshly desires, we're toast. Do you agree? So do you have something to pray for? We live in a world where we are so preoccupied with the world itself, sleeping at the most crucial hour. But note that, verse 42, when he went away a second time, he prayed. He said the same thing. 
If this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Jesus agreeing with the will of God. Again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once again. Maybe each time was an hour. This is what puts it so late, possibly in the wee hours now of the morning, the next day. And here was Peter over there going, no, I'm not falling away. You can't even stay awake and pray, and you're not going to fall away? Folks, don't overestimate yourselves. Not a one of us should. How many of you, just as a quick example, if you're like me, you get hungry, you get a little weak. And you do something, you say something to your spouse. And you go, I'm sorry, I, I'm just hungry. <laughs> or I was tired. Or it's been a long day. You know, I'm sorry. We use those excuses all the time. Our temper gets a little bit shorter. I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm tired, I'm hungry. It's been a long week. I flew all night, I drove all day, whatever it is. We get weak in these silliest things if the spirit inside of us doesn't overwhelm that. And the flesh will win. Don't tempt yourself. Carry food everywhere you go. <laughs> Verse 45, then he came to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. As a principal here, I was reading from Oswald Chambers from this one, and uh, um, he says something along the lines of, that's the way God works. He gives us an opportunity, gives us a chance to pray, to, to take part in something really huge in ministry. And when we fail, and we know it, like sleeping during a, during a time when they're supposed to be praying, Jesus gives them another chance, and then he says, okay, it's done, it's over. Let's get out of here. Let's move on. That's the grace of God. He forgives. We'll move on. I'll give you another chance. Let's move on. Let's, let's get out of here. Get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Verse 47, while he was still speaking. Now, if he's, while he's still speaking, and he's just awakened them the third time, they're all bedhead, right? All of them. Just, they just awakened. It's been a long day and a short night for them. While he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve. Stop there. Matthew's writing this in hindsight. Matthew's not writing this as it unfolds. He's writing it in hindsight, knowing what Judas, Judas did. I'm struck by the fact that he doesn't say Judas, that low-down worm, showed up to betray Jesus. None of the writers do that. And I love that. Because I think all of them have figured out they're like Peter. I'm not going to call Judas a bad name. I'm not going to call him a low-life worm. I'm not going to call him anything. Because of what he did, I could have done that's what we do when we're older and wiser and we look back and we see what people have done. We're not so judgmental of them because we know we're just as bad, maybe worse. Oh, when you're young and wet behind the ears and you think you've got it all, you judge everyone. <laughs> I know it not only from experience personally, but from watching people interact regularly. There are people that are not here today who are at odds with one another over the silly judgmental stuff sinfulness Stu stupidity judgmentalism he doesn't call him anything he just says Judas one of the twelve what would you have called him if you were writing that Judas that low life no good backstabbing traitor no he just says Judas one of the twelve came up and accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs now Judas had met with him in Gethsemane on numerous occasions. He knew where Jesus was now. He had gone back to town. Jesus had dismissed him. He had gone back to town. He brought the, those that were seeking Jesus' life. And he, it's a whole mob. It could be a thousand people here maybe. Accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs. Who do they think Jesus is? Some animal? Came from the chief priests and the elders of the people. He says in verse 48, Now he who is betraying him gave them a sign saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one, sees him. I think that's interesting. You could say, well, it was dark and they're not going to know which one. Maybe it was. Maybe it was so dark they don't know which one Jesus is. And that makes some sense. 
There's no street lights in the Garden of Gethsemane in the first century. But they all come out with torches. Jesus has been walking around for years. The chief priests and the elders of the people knew him well. But most of them, it seems, didn't. In fact, the people that probably wanted, his, wanted G- Jesus killed probably didn't go out late at night. It probably wasn't Caiaphas or Annas. It probably wasn't those Sanhedrin members. It was probably a delegation from them. Y'all go get the guy. Judas will show you which one. And Judas has told them, look, the one I go up and greet, and in those days it was a kiss. It wasn't a smack on the lips. In the Middle East, Near East, you embrace, you kiss one cheek, you kiss the other cheek. That's an embrace. We shake hands or hug, whatever it might be, and there was a kiss. And Jesus, Judas had said, whomever I kiss, he is the one. The word seize him means take control of, arrest him. Immediately, Judas Judas went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, and he kissed him. Maybe Judas at this point, you see, the disciples still don't know it's Judas. They don't know he's the betrayer. Judas may have in mind, look, I'm going to get in, I'm going to get out, and I'm going to step back and act horrified over what happens. Maybe he's still trying to lay low. Hail, Rabbi. Greetings, Rabbi, my teacher. And he kissed him. The word for kissed here is, is uh, katafileo. It means with brotherly affection. With brotherly affection. In fact, the way it's written may, may have Judas clinging to him a little bit longer than your average greeting. Maybe he knew what he was doing. Maybe he knew what was going to happen to Jesus. Maybe there's some humanity we see in him. He holds him and Jesus said to him, friend, do what you have come for. In other words, get to it. Don't schmooze me. Don't act like you're something when we all know exactly what you are. In fact, we learn from John's gospel and Luke's gospel at this point that Satan himself has entered into Judas. Satan is working through Judas because Judas gave him permission the word for friend is used in Matthew 20, 13 in the parable where the guy is complaining. And he says, we worked all day. And you're going to give these guys who worked one hour the same pay as you gave us all day? And the landowner says, friend, take what you have and go. It's not buddy. It's not my close friend. It's, hey, pretender, take what you have and get out of town. He says the same word for friend in Matthew 22, 12 in the parable of the wedding feast. The guy that's there without wedding clothes, he says, friend, comrade, essentially he's saying, pretender, get out of here. And he does. It's the same word here. You are a false friend. Hey, bud. Hey, pal. Friend, pretender, do what you've come for. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And I would imagine there's a moment of silence as Jesus looks at him, pulls away from the embrace. Friend, do what you came here for. In a silence. And then they arrested him. John's gospel says that, says that uh, Jesus identified himself. Who are you looking for? We're looking for Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus says, that's me. What do they do? Of course, he doesn't say, that's me. He says, I am. And they all fall back on their knees. And Jesus says, who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth, that's me, I am. And then they arrest him. It's an odd, odd arrest. Arresting the Son of God. And behold, one of those who was with Jesus, who were with Jesus, reached and drew out his sword, struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Uh, the, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptics don't tell us who it was. John, after Peter was dead, where he wouldn't get in trouble, does identify this person as Peter. Peter, he's already messed up once. I couldn't pray with Jesus. I feel like an idiot. We've moved on from there. I've got a sword. I'm going to make this right. Now, imagine if you've got a sword and you're swinging it at somebody that you cut off their ear. How does that happen? This guy must have had like Dumbo ears or something. The only thing I can figure is he grabbed him in a headlock and cut off his ear. How else do you get it? Unless he slings it up against the side of his head and hits it here and cuts it half off which would hurt his head. Luke is the only one that tells us that Jesus says enough of this nonsense and then heals the man's ear right in front of everyone. I don't know how you cut off the ear, but Peter 
wishing to exonerate himself, wields a sword. Jesus said to him, put your sword back in its place, for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels, a legion of 6,000. Jesus is saying, at my disposal, if I call them, I can bring down 72,000 heavenly beings to rescue me. Peter, I don't need your sword. That's the love of our Lord. Anytime he wanted to, at his disposal, he could call down angels to rescue him. But he didn't. You know, let me say something about this perish by the sword. Ephesians 6, 12 and following. What is the sword of the Spirit? What's the sword of the Spirit in Paul's theology? It's the Word of God. The Word of God that I shared with you earlier is preached out of love for Christ, feeding his sheep. It's not a bunch of little lambs. You give them sheep food, whatever it may be. It's about spiritual sheep feeding them the Word of God. Jesus says in uh, John 17, 17, he said, Lord, sanctify them by your truth. And then he says what? Your word is truth. We are sanctified. That word means to be made holy. We are made holy. Don't miss this, folks. We are made holy by the word of God. By the word of God. This makes us holy. It sanctifies us. So why don't we perish with the sword of the Spirit. How about that? Can can I say that? It's not what it says, but can I make that move? Is that okay? I mean, what are you going to do? Throw something at me? I want to perish not with a a sword. I'm out there cutting people's ears off. I want to perish, and I want to encourage you to perish with the sword of the Spirit. Let us die for doing that. He says in verse 54, how then will the Scriptures be fulfilled, which say that it must happen this way? There's so many scriptures to go to. I would just say, focus in on Isaiah 53, where Jesus says, or 750 years before Jesus comes, it is the will of God the Father to crush his son, to lead him like a lamb going to slaughter. Jesus is saying this has to happen. It has to unfold this way. Don't try to get in the way. At that time, Jesus said to the crowds, I think this is sarcastic. I think it is. Some of you think, that Jesus would never be sarcastic, but sarcasm is a spiritual gift. Some of us have been deeply gifted with it. <laughs> he says, if you come out here with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber, every day you used to sit in the temple teaching. You didn't seize me there. In other words, what are you guys doing with swords and clubs? I have been among you at the temple every day for the past week teaching you. Some of you have been hanging on every word I've said. And you think you need clubs and swords to arrest me? You've missed it. Sarcasm. I was there among you. Why didn't you take me then? Here's the answer, verse 56. But all this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures of the prophets. And then what Jesus prophesied in verse 31 comes to pass. Then all the disciples left him and fled, just as he said they would. They did exactly what they said they wouldn't. Not us, Lord. We'll die with you. They needed to flee. If they didn't flee, they'd all been killed right then and there. And Jesus had another plan for them. Let me go through a couple things. The five minutes I have left. It's on your bulletin, I know it. You can read it. I'm just not sure that you will. Number three. God later used Peter's pride to humble and restore him. So let me give you hope. When you've failed, when I've failed to do and to be what Christ would have me do and to be. I'm able to grow through it. You're able to grow through it and be better at a later time because of it. God forgives. We stand on the grace of God. It's the only, only way we're going to keep being forgiven is the grace of God that continues to give and forgive over and over to bring us to the point at which Peter, we can read First Peter and Second Peter and we can read a godly man filled with the Holy Spirit giving us God's word. 30 years removed from his bravado days. God used his pride 
to humble and then to restore him. B, God used the disciples, cowardice, who later laid the church's foundation. These men who ran away are the ones that when they saw the resurrected Lord Jesus, their bravado actually was true because they stared death in the face. The story of of Thomas, to me, is always one of the most interesting ones. Uh, it, it is said that Thomas, the early church father, says that Thomas made his way into India and preached the gospel. Can you imagine India filled with the gospel of Jesus Christ? It once was. And they killed him there because they kept telling him, stop talking. And it is said that he died because he would not stop talking about his friend who died and came back to life. God used the cowardice, the blood of the martyrs, Tertullian said, is what? The seed of the church. The blood that these men and women spilled all over the ground grew us. God used the cowardice. See, God restores and renews. 1 John 1, 9. Confess your sins. God is faithful to forgive. He's saying that to Christians. Christians sin. Sin is always battling with us. The Spirit of God in us and our, our flesh, it's battling. Are you winning? Is Christ winning? Is the Spirit of God more powerful than your flesh? Your answer is going to be yes and no. Depends on the day. Depends on the moment. When we grow in Christ, we grow stronger. And each time we sin, we ask God once again, wash my feet. I confess to you, Lord, I failed. Let's move on. Can I have another chance? Yes. Nothing lasts except the grace of God by which we stand. Nothing lasts. Not you, not your works, not your deeds. They are remembered insofar as they serve Christ. But the grace of God is the foundation on which we stand. D, when tempted to sin, pray. Jesus prayed. Ought not we? The greatest temptation that you have. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. Got through it every time with scripture. What is it that, what's your kryptonite? What is it that could have you? Maybe it's one thing, maybe it's a bunch of things. You have something to pray about. I do. Or are you sleeping? And if you're praying for something that God has said no to, say, Lord, your will be done let your name be glorified in the no you gave me. Even though it's the 1,000th no I've gotten in the past day. Thank you, Lord. Your will be done, not mine. And let me just close with that last one. Prayer was never meant to change God. Prayer is the avenue through which he transforms us. Prayer is the avenue through which God transforms us. You want your will to be God's will? That scares me. God, I don't want you to do what I want to do. I'm going to give you what I want. And if praying for it's going to get it for me and it's your will, please let it be done. But if not, please say no. I don't want my will over yours. I've seen what happens when we foist our will upon God. You remember Saul? He's the best example in all of Scripture. The Israelites going, we want a king, Samuel. Give us a king. Samuel goes, you don't want a king. No, we want a king. Let him go out and fight our battles. You don't want a king. Give us a king. God tells Samuel, they want a king. Give him a king. We want him. He's tall, dark, and handsome. Oh, yeah, they overlooked the short, ruddy fella. Right, Doug? We're short and ruddy. Get the tall, dark, and handsome dude. We want him. Keep pushing your will. Keep shaking your fist at God. He might just give you what you want. Lord, this is my request. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Let's pray. Lord, there are so many requests among we as people. We are in pain, both physically, spiritually, emotionally. We hurt. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. If we did, we'd probably take our own lives. I pray, Lord, that we would be your people bowing before you, saying, come what may. We vow to serve you. And if, through some tragic overestimation of ourselves, Lord, we fail you, we praise you in advance. 
We prophesy knowing that you will forgive us, and we thank you. May the love of Christ flow through us. May we see his love in every moment of this passion, every moment, every word that he speaks. May we be compelled by your love to tell the world, to show the world through our behavior who we are. I pray for these youth. They have spent a week in your word, enjoying the fellowship of one another, being molded and shaped by the men and women you took to camp to mold and shape them. They live in a world where people just don't care. May your light shine brightly through them. May the seeds you planted be watered. May they come to know Christ if they haven't already. And what I pray for them, I pray for all of us. Send us out of here, Lord, warriors. Not mean warriors, not with swords. The sword of the Spirit, the sword of the Word of God. Let it be seen in us and heard in us. Lord, this we pray together, all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord God bless you as you go, and may his light shine through you for all to see.